the first female surgeon in the Department of Surgery at Harvard and pediatric surgeon in Texas, Dr. Benji Francis Brooks was a pioneer in the field of pediatric surgery for women in the United States. Here, we will describe how Dr. Brooks overcame the stereotypical gender roles of the early 20th century to become a leader in medical education and child advocacy. Dr. Brooks was born in Louisville, Texas in 1918. She was surgically inclined from early childhood when she performed operations on her sister's dolls with manicure scissors at four years of age. <laughs> her mother taught her to read at an early age. Given her unusual gifts and aspirations as a female during this time period, her fifth grade teacher thought the young Dr. Brooks had an intellectual disability. She obtained a Bachelor's of Science at North Texas State Coll Teachers College by 19 years old, followed by a Master's in Science. She then taught high school science for four years before deciding to go to medical school. She attended medical school at University of Texas Medical Branch in 1944 at the age of 27. She then went to residency in surgery and pediatrics at University of Pennsylvania and Children's Medical Center in Boston. She completed her studies in pediatric surgery at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children in Glasgow, Scotland. Once Dr. Brooks completed her training, she returned to the States and became Harvard's first female in the Department of Surgery. However, she felt her home state calling to her, so in 1958, she returned to Texas to become the first female and third pediatric surgeon in the state. Her career in Texas included working in Houston at Texas Children's Hospital and St. Joseph's Hospital. She was on faculty at Baylor College of Medicine. In 1973, she became the Chief of Pediatric Surgery at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. Additionally, she was on faculty at the University of Texas at Tyler in the Department of Leadership and Ethics, given her interest in the care of preterm infants and the rights of children. Her research interests included congenital defects, burn treatment, prevention of hepatitis, and non-operative management of splenic injuries. She was also known for her innovation. When faced with a lack of instruments for her smallest patients, she went to jeweler's stores and modified their tools to operate on infants. Given her impressive career, it's not surprising Dr. Brooks was recognized both locally and nationally. She was bestowed an alumni award from North Texas State University and University of Texas Medical Branch, and the Artist of Life Award from International Women's Writing Guild, honoring high achieving women. In 1983, she was awarded the Horatio Alger Award for Americans with Initiative, Perseverance, Leadership, Commitment to Excellence, and people that stress the importance of higher education, community service, and determination to achieve a better future. Finally, she was indoctrinated into the Women's Hall of Fame in Texas in 1985. After retiring, she continued to volunteer in surgical mission trips to Romania until two years before her death in 1998. Her legacy continues through the University of Texas, Houston, Benji Brooks Award for physicians who serve as positive role models for students. The Benji Brooks Foundation for Children was created by a parent of one of her patients and has greatly advanced the surgical career of surgical care of young children in Texas, supporting endowed chairs at medical colleges, donating special equipment to hospitals, and providing research grants for pediatric disease. The Dr. Benji Francis Brooks Children's Hospital Graduate Medical Education Support Reauthorization Act provides hospitals that train physicians and pediatrics with financial support with the goal of ensuring children have access to physicians specialized in pediatrics. And finally, near and dear to APSA is the Benji Brooks Committee, which became official in 2019. Their mission is to educate, inspire, and support women pediatric surgeons to realize their professional and personal goals and to serve the pediatric surgery community in addressing the issues inherent to training and practice by maintaining a diverse and balanced workforce. At this point, I would like to thank the female pediatric surgeons, research mentors, and fellows who have invested significant time, 
energy, and friendships with me and many others seeking a career in pediatric surgery. Thank you. Well, I wish Dr. Brooks was here to, to hear that uh, ad adulation that we have for uh, the, today. Uh, my name is Craig Lillehigh, and together with Chuck Schneider, we chair ABSA's Professional Development Committee. Now, the PDC is a remarkably hardworking and energetic group of surgeons who, who actually write, uh, edit, revise some 1,200 expert questions on our pediatric surgery platform. They also work with multiple uh, other committees to uh, highlight some of the articles of interest each month. And in fact, each week, uh, uh, most of us get a, uh, our Sunday space learning from that, that same group. But one of the most important, thank you. <laughs> but, but actually one of the most important challenges for the PDC is to identify the knowledge and practice gaps of our specialty. And it's those top uh, gaps that uh, are addressed each year at our annual meeting with the Tech Talks. Uh, it's my honor to introduce our final uh, Tech Talk for this annual meeting. Uh, we heard a lot on Wednesday from a systematic review about lymphatic malformations and the toolkit that's available for us by our Outcomes and Quality and Safety Committee. It's Dr. Kulangowski's charge uh, this morning to, uh, to highlight some of the developments in the medical therapy of, uh, of lymphatic malformations that have become really revolutionary. Now, Dr. Kulangowski is well equipped uh, to address these questions. She, uh, we're very proud that early on in her career, she spent two years at, at Boston Children's, a very productive two years fellowship with uh, Dr. Fishman studying vascular malformations, but she's gone far beyond that. She's currently an associate professor at the University of Colorado, and she's the surgical director for their vascular anomalies program. And in fact, she's one of the leading authorities in the management of vascular malformations. So Dr. Kulangowski, the podium is yours. Great, thank you for the opportunity to talk about a group of patients near and dear to my heart. I have no disclosures. Great, so consider this picture, that about one in 4,000 patients or live births uh, results in a patient with a lymphatic malformation. This is actually even more common than patients being born with intestinal atresias. And aside from the focal lymphatic malformations that can be easily resected, many result in pain, infection, bleeding, coagulopathy, and even death. But the good news is that in the last 20 years, there has been an explosion of knowledge regarding the genetic causes and cellular signaling pathways responsible for lymphatic malformations. And in many ways, this parallels what's gone on in the cancer world, where you can find a gene and use a targeted pharmacotherapy to treat the patient. And so I don't want to get too into the weeds with the science stuff, but there are two really important principles to understand about lymphatic malformations. The first is that lymphatic malformations occur due to somatic mutations. That means that these mutations are not inherited and occur within the lymphatic malformation themselves. And so that in order to understand the genetic profile of a lymphatic malformation, you may need to biopsy the lymphatic malformation itself. A biopsy of unaffected tissue may not yield a result. It is possible that moving forward in the years to come that advanced cell-free DNA techniques obviate the need for biopsy. The other really important principle to understand 
is that lymphatic malformations occur due to some activating mutations in cellular signaling pathways. And the two most common pathways are the PIK3 mTOR pathway and the RAS pathway. Less important than the names of the pathways is understanding that these activating mutations result in increased cellular proliferation and growth. And so this is sometimes has helped me uh, understand why, you know, a patient clinically uh, who presents to the office will appear as if their lymphatic malformation is actually changing and growing before your eyes. And so clinically, uh, we're all very familiar with cystic lymphatic malformations. These are commonly occur in the head, neck, groins, and these are due to errors in the PIK3CA gene. Another type of lymphatic malformation occurs along the RAS pathway. And these complex lymphatic malformations can be multifocal, found across the body, and sometimes result in problems with lymphatic flow and conduction. And so for many years, we've been able to use things that we're very comfortable treating lymphatic malformations with, such as sclerotherapy and surgical debulking procedures. But about 15 years ago, uh, some very astute vascular anomalists, hematologists, oncologists, and surgeons, some of you here in this room, went out on a limb and realized that there were parallels between cancer and lymphatic malformations and offered sirolimus to these patients, which is an mTOR inhibitor. And what these authors found was that the lymphatic malformations in patients with very severe vascular anomalies responded very well to the sirolimus. And then some years later, similar teams and some of the same authors published another series of studies showing how sirolimus really dramatically improved some of these lymphatic malformations. And sometimes the lymphatic malformation seemed to shrink before these authors' eyes. And so now that we had a drug, it became kind of clear, you know, that we needed some guidelines on who would be candidate for pharmacotherapies. And so as surgeons, we operate for pain, infection, bleeding, obstruction. And so I would propose that these are the same indications to use pharmacotherapy for our patients with lymphatic malformations because they can cause pain and bleeding, skin and soft tissue infections, infections of body cavities, as well as lymphatic accumulation and leaking problems, obstruction of vision of the airway, of the intestine, as well as mobility problems, and pictured but not also pictured are the lifelong psychosocial consequences of living with lymphatic malformations. And so um, going back to the cellular signaling pathways, remembering that these are activating mutations leading to cell growth and proliferation, the three drugs mentioned are all uh, inhibitors somewhere along the pathway. And so sirolimus is the most common and well-known uh, pharmacotherapy for lymphatic malformations. This drug can be given orally and it can be given across all age ranges, from the neonates to the elderly. And we use it and we have to follow serum blood concentrations. And so this is a downside of utilizing this drug is that we do have to do some frequent lab draws. And so you can use sort of more drug for more severe disease and less drug for less severe disease with the goal of the drug therapy to utilize the least amount of drug to achieve the maximal effect. Now there are some side effects with the drugs including headache, fatigue, stomatitis, immunosuppression, 
as well as for us as surgeons, concerns about wound healing and delayed wound healing. But another very astute team of vascular anomalists sought to sort of figure out whether or not sirolimus was safe to use uh, during operative procedures. So they divided their patients into two groups, those on and off sirolimus, and took them to the operating room and compared uh, wound complications and delayed wound healing and found no difference. And so the takeaway for us should be that it's probably safe to continue sirolimus uh, during our operative procedures. Also, anecdotally, some vascular anomalies teams utilize sirolimus in a neoadjuvant sort of way to soften or shrink lymphatic malformations ahead of procedures, and also to minimize some of the post-operative side effects of operating on large lymphatic malformations, to reduce the lymphatic fluid accumulation and re-expansion of the lymphatic malformation in the resection bed. And so this is a theme, to use an inhibitor to stop the cellular proliferation and growth and recall that complex lymphatic malformations occur along the RAS pathway. And just downstream from RAS is MEK, which is also a protein kinase. And these authors decided to give trametinib to a patient with a complex lymphatic anomaly to try to subside some of the lymphatic leaking problems that they were experiencing. And what they found sometime after starting the trametinib on MRI is that it appeared that the lymphatic system was reorganizing itself and the patient improved dramatically. Now there are a subset of lymphatic malformations that occur alongside the PIK3CA related overgrowth syndromes. And what vascular anomalies teams noticed is that some of these lymphatic malformations occurring alongside this PROS or PIK3CA related overgrowth spectrum of diseases were much more recalcitrant to sirolimus. And so they decided to try a direct inhibitor of PI3K, alpelisib. And these patients not only experienced a dramatic improvement in the, their lymphatic malformations, but also the overgrowth was dramatically reduced. And just last year in 2022, the Food and Drug Administration approved alpelisib for our patients with PIK3CA related overgrowth syndromes. And so how do we monitor treatment response? Well, there are no clear guidelines to date, and I think this is something that we could all do better with. But some of the ways to follow outcomes include clinical, in terms of how is the patient doing? Um, are they having less bleeding infection? Uh, is the lesion smaller? As well as radiographically looking especially for those that are inoperable, is the lymphatic malformation smaller? And then treatment duration really does vary and should really be driven by the patient and family's goals. Um, and I think this is something really difficult for us as surgeons is that sometimes these medical therapies are indefinite. And for me, and I think for all of us in the room, uh, prescribing drugs uh, can be something that is hard. And so I really highly recommend partnering with other specialists, hematologists, oncologists, and sometimes in the context of larger multidisciplinary vascular anomalies teams to support the patient, the family, and us as surgeons to provide optimal care. And so finally, unlike cancer that has the potential for cure, this is not always true for many patients with lymphatic malformations. But I think now the time is more hopeful than ever for these patients because we can identify genetic causes and use targeted pharmacotherapies to augment our traditional treatments of sclerotherapy and surgery 
to help minimize the long-term impact and sometimes devastating consequences of lymphatic malformations. Thank you.